Hey everybody, and welcome to a, the first episode of a very special series of Art of NGF podcasts. These are the Ozark Talks. This is based on the Netflix show Ozark, which we discovered after about two or three episodes seemed to have the seeds of something very important and useful in direct relation to the art of not giving a fuck to the topic of uh, an experience of transcendence and simply to taking full responsibility of your life and living the best life you possibly can no matter what the circumstances so this show has either accidentally or purposefully showcased numerous tools and situations and mental training that you can apply in your life right away. So what we're going to do with the Ozark Talks is dig into that episode by episode. So it'll be 10 talks for now. And this is episode one. So what I encourage you to do is to go watch episode one before you listen to the talk. Even if you've already seen it before, the show really ripens with multiple viewings. It's definitely meant for multiple viewings. So go watch episode one, then come on back and listen to the talk. And then you can follow along with us as we go week by week, episode by episode, and start to take some of that training on for yourself. Why don't you just say goodbye to my kids? They're asleep and I'll just leave them a message, you know? And they're confused and worried about me. Hang on one second, I'll just leave a message. I'll tell them that I'm going away somewhere and then I'm going to miss them. about anything that I do. Not once. Not once. You don't need to do anything to Wendy. Are you ready? No, no, no. no hang on, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. One second. Just talk to me for one second. Just hang on a second. Um. More shoreline. More shoreline than the whole coast of California. Excuse me. This place right here has more shoreline than the whole coast of California. And apparently, every summer, they got, they got, they got. Presenting The Art of Not Giving a Fuck with Garrett Dawn. So welcome, we've got Lance and Taylor here. Hey guys. Hello. Hey everybody. Hey. <clears throat> and let's just go right on in. So the episode one begins with an opening scene of the main character, Marty Bird, uh, bringing suitcases full of something through the darkness to some undisclosed location while he's giving a speech about money about the definition of money. And he sets up in that speech, he sets up how ridiculous everyone's life is, how they don't have enough money to even retire. Uh, the, the dream that they've been working for is actually corrupt and they haven't made it. And by the end he says, that money is a measure of a man's choices. And so that's how it kicks off. Do you guys have any thoughts about that opening scene? Yeah, he's, um, well, it ends up he's uh, doing his pitch to the couple in his office. So he's, he's, ru he's, he's running a, a well-crafted script to, scripted sales pitch to these uh to the couple in front of them so as inspired as it sounds it's it's automated at the same time he's just 
going through the paces of his day to day existence. Yeah, he's fully locked into it. And then they're showing us, they're giving us a huge foreshadowing of all kinds of things to come because of course there he is in the darkness doing something mm -hmm. apparently shady while giving this mm -hmm. about money. <laughs> Taylor, anything, mm -hmm. anything stand out to you before we move forward? Um, well, jumping back to the part where he's in his office. Well, that's where we're going to now. Oh, yeah, well, let's, let's go. There. All right, so, well, the scene opens with uh, Marty received looking at his email and then giving that speech to the couple and There's the top email. I didn't notice notice this until about the fifth viewing, but it says don't open at work in all caps <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we see him start to watch this uh, this porn video while giving the well still pitching the couple pretty successfully yeah, and that kind of shows the 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 running. He's dissociated a bit from his reality a little bit. The fact that he can manage these two things at once: running this script that he does and watching uh, what his wife get nailed from behind. Um, you know, he's on autopilot. He's in survivor mode. He's disconnected from um, his life. Yeah, it, uh, and they give us the hint right away that it is his, his wife or something related to him because it's from an email. It's not just him looking at videos. Although you might miss that on the first viewing. Oh, yeah, yeah probably. Uh, and then what was interesting too is that we see Bruce introduced straight away and he steps in and does a scammy move with the couple. Mm -hmm. Like Marty didn't need to do any scammy move. He knew he already had them. They were going to buy. And then Bruce comes in and does some scammy thing and then makes the sale right away yeah bruce is kind of the the definition of the manipulated life right yeah he thinks he has to always have an edge even when he doesn't need to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah because uh, <laughs> even when he doesn't need to because clearly they were profiting from uh, their business with dell all along i'm not sure they needed to be doing the the skimming that they were doing. No, and Marty's unaware of it too. And it's pretty clear that he mm -hmm. didn't have any clue that was going on. And which is another uh, aspect of him being asleep to his situation. So that's what that entire mm -hmm. opening scene I think does is establishes Marty as asleep, being taken advantage of by people. And he's focused on saving money and creating this future, but he's definitely not excited. And Bruce calls him out on it too. Now, something yeah, big does. happens. They're touring the, the new office, or the potential office, and Bruce gives him the Ozark pamphlet. And it's at a moment when Bruce is like, you gotta live a fucking exciting life, man. And I think right here we see something that's in a lot of Sufi traditions, which is learning to take instructions from reality. It doesn't matter who's delivering it or by what means the instruction gets to you, but you, can recognize it as an instruction and then take it. So he gets instructions right there when uh, Bruce hands him the Ozark pamphlet. And he says the secret words, he tells Marty the secret words, cash rich and more shoreline than the entire coast of California. So, <laughs> so Marty gets the secret words from Bruce. Right there. His, his final gift. <laughs> but he hasn't yet even realized what that is. He didn't barely wanted the pamphlet. He, he's not aware of it of what's happening yet but he becomes very very fully aware well marty's spy has been activated by his uh hiring of the the private eye to keep an eye on his wife that shows that there's an extra he has something extra running that he's starting to take an observer perspective on his life which is the catalyst to him breaking free right and we see so we see the beginning of his collapse with the, the porn video with his wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where, the, that's where it starts. That's, that's a huge crack in, in his, uh, his well-crafted armor. Yeah. I, I love the, uh, the line when he meets with his wife 
and uh, she asks how his day was, and Marty replies back, "How was yours? How was your day? Yeah. Yeah. Let's reboot." Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't we get? Didn't you get groceries on Monday? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he knows. So, so we're everyone's deadened. The next scene that that stood out to me, and you guys just jump in anytime here. If I'm missing things or something you want to add, uh, is he's. He goes to where all the prostitutes are, and we see a prostitute get in the car. But of course, we find out that he was fantasizing that while beaten off. And his fantasy, what stood out to me the most on this viewing was that his fantasy was that he was being appreciated for all he had done for his family. So she, the woman goes through the list of various things he did, how long he's been married, how, how you know, how he didn't cheat, uh, how he puts... Christmas presents under the tree since 2002 <laughs> and everything that he does. So he, he's fantasizing not about just some sexual experience, but actually someone giving him appreciation that he feels that is uh, obviously not there from the wife and the family. Yeah. And that scene also shows why uh, Marty's a good candidate to um, transcend his living experience into a new experience because when he's met with this uh, this situation in his wife with his with his wife he feels the obsessive pull to uh, have uh, revenge or act out um, which he does he goes and uh, in his imagination he goes to the goes to the prostitute but he's doing it with uh, awareness mm -hmm. he's not like he didn't go actually bang a bunch of prostitutes and even if he had he, he's bringing he didn't fall victim to his reaction to that situation as harshly as he could have yeah we see that about him multiple times throughout the, the episode actually yeah now I'm, I'm thinking, I, I, it's amazing I missed this part uh, because I skipped right over the, the dinner. And it's like the last supper because that's the last dinner before everything gets crazy. And everyone is just fucked up. The kids are fighting. They have to reboot the conversation. And the meal is all nice, but nobody eats it except for Marty. And then the wife says, yeah, oh, well, great. He's like, great dinner. And she's like, yeah, I spent a lot of time on it. And yeah, I worked hard at it. Yeah, I worked hard at it. <clears throat> so they're at the last and there's no satisfaction in anyone no none none at all very important point because people could easily try to write the show off as just some you know action drama thing but if you start to pick up on these cues right here you you can find the ticket into a lot more depth of what's being presented totally and there there may be a reflex to get uh um, lost in the idea that we would be glorifying um, Marty's quote unquote immoral life choices, but that's completely not the case. There's a deeper level to this story that's being told that is so relates to everyone's life yeah. when they start to apply the art and not giving a fuck. These themes are unmistakable. Yeah, they're exact milestones. Mm -hmm. So what I thought was interesting is after the dinner, that's when he goes out to the prostitute area. And it's so we see it's all darkness. It's the middle of the night. And everything has changed already just with him finding out about the wife cheating. But he doesn't realize that's just the prelude to the rest of the changes. And I think this was the dark night of the soul. And it goes from, I think it actually begins the moment Marty gets put on his knees by Dell, that it actually shatters into it right then, and it ends four days later. So we can establish mm -hmm. what uh, Dell shows up. Marty gets called in. He can't refuse. There's no way to to not go. And Dell tells the Carlotta story. And what we mm -hmm. see later is that that Carlotta story applies to Marty's wife, to Wendy cheating on him as well. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Touch on that again. But I thought found that interesting this time because uh, mm -hmm. later Marty really figures it out, and everyone's response to Dell is completely submissive, and Marty's just there watching the entire time. He doesn't 
He doesn't cower. He doesn't back back away. He's not afraid. And he just uh, mm -hmm. sees Trudell in an instant and calls him out, doesn't answer his question, doesn't, you know, he reframes the situation right away. But Dell one-ups him by shooting the woman in the bathroom. So mm -hmm. Marty mm -hmm. calls it a ruse, and then Dell's like, oh yeah, a ruse, I'll show you. Yeah, that was hilarious, though. <laughs> so right away, what we see, I think that scene established uh, something really important as well, is that life means nothing. Life means nothing to those people, uh, to Dell. And that's that. That's what he's facing. That his life actually could be. Yeah. An instant. Yeah, and it's uh, a great lesson to Marty that he needs to think creatively. That his uh, initially thought he could use his uh, his wit to outthink and yeah, kind of alpha up on uh, Dell. That's clearly not the situation. He's facing death incarnate. And so the, his usual methods aren't going to work here. And that's the, the humbling of Marty is coming face to face with all of his uh, co-workers dying and then having a, a gun pointed at his head. And it's um, a level of, it's a humbling that he couldn't, he didn't receive when his wife cheated on him that wasn't enough of a death blow no. for him to to feel the call to action to feel the call to creative action now what's fascinating about that all those people getting killed in front of him is it's a that's a metaphor it's a very powerful metaphor but it's when i remember when i when something hit me uh, my life crushed under the weight of itself and i left eugene oregon moved to portland it happened within days it was really like one of these four day things of just crushing going out around in my dead life still trying to pretend like it was legit and alive and then just left packed up shit threw away what i couldn't put in the car and took off and it was as though all the people and situations in my life were removed the same way dell removed them from his life like dell actually is an angel of death there He's liberating Marty from, from the prison that he was in. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it can feel with the undoing process. Mm -hmm. Taylor, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, up until this point, the picture that we've seen of Marty, even as you said, even through uh, discovering the cheating wife, um, as Bruce put it earlier, uh, Marty is living a tragically subdued life and at this point I think is where we start to see that start to shift you know as you, as you said he gets the call to action he starts to wake up a little bit so he starts to access his potential his true potential starts to come to the surface <laughs> yeah it comes alive and it's only through that he confront he has the confrontation with death and it's sustained. The angel of death sees it sees yeah. it in him yeah Dell sees it right in him yeah and it's amazing and he tells him he also he says you're special marty you're special marty. Mm -hmm. you got a gift <laughs> we never hear what that is but he just we, we get it told to us directly and so that next scene, Taylor uh, had, had something to say about where Marty, uh, Marty now steps up in another, he gets kneeled down. And what, what did you say? So everyone had been told something. Yeah, so uh, Dell was walking around to each person there and uh, would ask them, are you ready? And he was essentially asking them, are you ready to die? Uh, and as he goes around to each person and asks them this, they all uh, kind of submit to it. <laughs> Begrudgingly, yeah, okay, shoot me now. Mm -hmm. um, he gets to Marty and he says, okay, are you ready? Marty looks at him and says, no, 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 no. 
let's talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a that's a such a that's an incredibly beautiful moment. Marty is saying, "I'm not guilty," and that, and it's not just about um, the the money laundering. Marty's saying, I'm not guilty. I, I'm not a zombie. Mm -hmm. And I, I will not fall victim to the angel of death. Yeah, what a beautiful scene. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. And he pulls out the pamphlet. <laughs> yeah. More, more shoreline than the entire coast of California because Dell's about to shoot him. And he's like, Del, and Dell says, what? It completely breaks set. He breaks the frame that Dell has, has established. Yeah. And he realizes it's not through, through power or dominance. At that moment, it's, it's uh, just a trick in a way. But it shocks Dell out of his state enough to notice there's someone alive in front of him. Mm hmm And... So yeah, he stands up at that point. So he's been knelt down. And during the course of the conversation, he stands up. He gets to his feet and proceeds to, uh, he's like, hang on, hang on. Whenever he sees Dell, starts to doubt him. He's like, hang on, hang on. Listen to me. It's cash rich. He says the, he says the magic words. So he's, he suddenly takes the instruction from reality. He realizes he's been given exactly what he needs to get through this level. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. the yeah. pamphlet from Bruce, but he was yeah. given the, the final instruction from Bruce. So that was uh, exceptional. And then Dell kneels him back down. So Taylor, you, we talked about that last night. What did you think of that? Why did Dell bring him back down to his knees and act like he was going to shoot him? Well, I think... I think that was a move by Dell to not be making a deal with somebody uh, on the same, on, on equal ground. You know, Dell wanted to keep the upper hand, I think, the, uh, putting Marty in a vulnerable and uh, pretty scary situation before making this deal. But uh, what yeah. did you guys see in that? Yeah, I think Dell, I think you're right on that. that Dell had to show him who's, who's the boss of the situation. He couldn't just let Marty run it. And Marty learned something important there too. He has to give, he has to let them believe that they're in charge. It doesn't, or it doesn't matter if they think they're in charge or not, but he, he, but Absolutely. he letting them believe that is going to be a powerful move for him. And man, that's an incredibly powerful move. Yeah. That's a great realization. And then at that moment, he thinks he got shot. He really thinks that he just got shot and he's facing his own death. We he actually, thinks he got shot? What? We hear a gunshot. And then he starts watching the memories of laying underneath the, the trampoline with the kids. Oh, okay. I didn't connect a, a gunshot with that, uh, the scene underneath the trampoline there. But that was a, a wonderful um, rebirth moment there where he's, he's at peace beneath the trampoline. Yeah, and everything's going great. And we hear, yeah, we hear a gunshot right at the beginning of that. And suddenly, so they're trying to get the audience to see or to think that Marty just got shot. And he's living through the memories. And then suddenly Dell's like, okay, get up, get up. Mm. So then Dell gets him to stand up. So then Marty, stand, Marty faces his death, stands up. The very next scene he goes back to his house and is telling Wendy, okay, here's what's going on. We're totally fucked. And she's like, okay, let's go to the police. So they establish right here that the regular power structures, the, the appeal to authority isn't going to help. Mm -hmm. So they, they, now they're stripping him away of all the external stuff. That's where mm -hmm. this is that the, the police can't help. The FBI can't help. And what does Marty say to the faces? He, he said, well, I'll tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to panic. Yeah. <laughs> so right away he says we're not going to panic so Monday this shit happens with Dell everybody gets killed and Friday they are in the Ozarks so this week is what the rest of the episode consists of 
Mm -hmm. So there's still some loose ends tying them to Chicago. The next scene we see is Marty is going to get his eight million from the bank. And he dominates the bank with their own laws, because of course they don't want to produce that much cash, but he holds the banking laws that he knows so well uh, against them to where they're forced to provide him with all the cash. Mm -hmm. They have feds in there and he just walks in and he tells them exactly what's gonna happen. He's like, it's my fucking business. If I wanna swim around in, the, in 8 million cash in my hot tub. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they hold no power over him. Right. Um, he sees through. Right, he sees straight through to his objective. He's like, no matter what's happening today, that fucking 8 million is going to Dell. That's what's happening today. And no, no one can stop him. Yeah, and he, he doesn't get sucked into playing people's games at all. So he knows uh -huh. he knows his mission, his objective, and he cuts right through the games that everybody's playing and says yeah. how it is and how it's going to be. Yeah, he determines what's going to happen. So the very next conversation is him talking with the private investigator, and what, and he's trying to find a way out still. For him and the family he's like so new identities and we go somewhere or go to some other country and basically in that conversation he realizes he can't run there's no way out of the situation actually mm -hmm. no appeal to higher authority and no ability to run away so he's left he's on rails at this point so right after that we see then the, the detective gives him the address because the wife has now pulled the cash out so she's wavering and trying to run away from the situation as well of course, Dell shows up, and we see the sugar wood get plopped onto the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his wife uh, ab abandons him. Yeah, tries to jump ship, tries to abandon the Ozark plan, yeah. which is a, a whew, that's a, another harsh wake up call of uh, nobody gives a fuck about you, and. Uh, and Marty shows his ability to let these things go as his uh, family realigns to the circumstances. And, uh, and they adjust as the series goes on. And, um, and obviously not in this episode, but further down, him and his wife, they become more and more of a team. Mm-hmm. And what we see there too is that call with Dell and with Wendy sitting there and Dell brings up the Carlotta story again. And that's when Marty nails it. Um, he said, should I fire? What should I do with Carl? What should my father do with Carlotta? Carlotta. And he said, fire her. Why is that Marty? Well, because it's not the first time she stole. What is it? It's the first time you caught her. <laughs> mm-hmm. So he establishes that with Wendy and then says, your call. So we can, we can uh, go forward with this or I, we can just end our Wendy problem right here. <laughs> and he considers it. And uh, like you said, he has to go through a whole process of letting go. Mm -hmm. And the next scene is, uh, he's like, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> 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 Which was a little bit, we see some humor in there. Marty kind of like, I'll take my fucking respect, all right? <laughs> and, uh, but we also see then all the kid photos. We see a whole montage of kid photos, uh, family photos at the house. Mm. So that's, we see a child, so childhood's end and Marty confronting that, not just his kids. Again, that's where the regular uh, superficial viewing would leave you is, oh, he's so sad because his kids are now gonna have to face a more serious life. But it's everyone's childhood. It's moving into human adulthood, as Jed McKenna wrote about in his uh, series of books. But we're seeing the childhood's end, childhood's end of everyone, of all the characters in the family. Everyone was just out fucking around before this. Mm -hmm. Kids are all, you know, tied into the schools and just the city life. Barely there, not engaged with it. So then uh, we see he brings the money to Dell, and even at his most pain, he's able to achieve all this. 
even at his most you know destroyed he's found a new source of, of motivation in life and that's when Dell tells him you're special you have a gift he's basically Dell says I know you're you're full of shit about this Ozark story but because of who you are and what I see in you I'm gonna let you fucking run with it let's see what happens he says I'll roll the dice <laughs> I'm willing to roll the dice <laughs> So we see Marty's kind of been welcomed into the next echelon of, of operations. Then we see Wendy oh, no. and Charlotte break. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. Nah. I was just. So we see Wendy and Charlotte, the truck, the, the mini, minivan is loaded with all the money and they can't fit all their stuff. So the mission is essentially taking up, you know, more space than their life was. And Wendy and Charlotte break there and they, give, they come together. So this is, that's an important moment to see that the family's actually realigning, as you mentioned, Lance. Mm -hmm. And then the final scene uh, we lead into is the drive to the Ozarks. So the exodus from Chicago. And uh, the song Dex Dark by Radiohead starts to play. And they hit the, they hit the forest there uh, near the lake. The car pulls over, they ask, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I, I gotta pee. And so he walks pretty deep into the woods for a piss and leans against uh, a tree. And in the background, we, the lyrics, if you watch the lyrics on the screen uh, with the closed captioning, it says, in your life, there comes a darkness. And then he says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. At first, again, superficial viewing, you could think, oh, it's pitiful, he's, what an asshole, look what he's done. But what that actually is, is the only way he can say sorry that way with so much conviction is because he's embraced 100% responsibility. Mm -hmm. You see, he said, I was asleep. Look what I've done. Mm -hmm. Because remember that it's a measure of a man's choices. That was our opening scene, our opening line. And he's facing what, what those choices have amounted to. Because he's back down to zero on the dollars. He has $20,000 now. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that's uh, a pivotal moment there where he's he's sorry he's expressing how he feels for his uh his family and then ultimately it'll turn on himself and he's sorry he let himself down and then the, an internal process of forgiveness gets him up on his feet. He goes to his knees again. Look in the view. That's where it yeah. was. He comes to his knees and that's the end of the dark night of the soul. Yeah. And it's the most amazing depiction of it probably ever on film. And I bet you it goes unnoticed for that. But uh, what happens there is in your life, there comes a darkness. There's a spaceship blocking out the sky, like this power so far beyond you that's on top of you. And then he's saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Next line says, there's no way to hide. So he's got to face it. We're being set up that he's, he's got to face all this. And then at the very end, it says, the family comes running up. The little boy is totally fucking stoked. He's like, oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> the girl's standing there. She's kind of into it. And the wife comes up and is like, are we actually doing this? You know? Mm -hmm. They all walk up. And then the lyrics are saying, it's, it was just a laugh, just a laugh, just a laugh. Mm. So <laughs> we're being reminded of how the facing the death made the loss of all the things and all the money in his life just a laugh because he has the most important thing and suddenly we see the scene pans out and they're standing on this huge rock just completely solid above the entire lake mm -hmm. so i think we're seeing a foreshadowing of the entire uh series there mm -hmm. that's the opening that's essentially the opening to the rest of the entire show and Marty and the family are standing on top of that rock. And then we see it zoom out and it shows the greater wholeness of everything. You know, it zooms way out and, and everything resolves into beauty. Mm -hmm. but yeah, and there's no guarantees. This, this could all end badly, but mm -hmm. that's... <laughs> yeah, so we see the crushing of his entire life and then him seizing hold of it by taking full responsibility at the end, which was moving through a, a mass amount of pain, a massive amount. And uh, 
and then they all step into it together. So it starts, lost it. It starts with him and the family completely locked in and not even realizing they're in the prison of their own making. And at the end, we see them all step out of it completely. And the fact that the family goes along with him after he almost, he faces losing them essentially. Because Dell tells him, tells him that he's gonna kill Wendy and the kids a couple different times. I think three different times he mentions that. And the family coming along with him at the end then represents how he, if you get right with yourself, he gets right with himself under that tree and they all come and join up. So if you get right with yourself, everyone else will go along for the ride. Not everyone in your life that you handpick necessarily, but the people around you, you will be surrounded. Reality will support you. The forces that can help will show up and they will help. Even though you think you're completely alone. Yeah, and, and everyone else uh, gets killed off. It was important for them to get killed off because the only way you're gonna show that process in a one hour episode of a show uh, you, you have to resort to violence as a tool to communicate the swiftness with which those people would, will disappear mm -hmm. in your life. It might happen in two weeks instead of 15 minutes, <laughs> but, yeah. but it's that fast. It's just boom, and it's gone. The old ways, your old life is gone. And that happens to, to everyone who goes deep with the NGF work that the radical I'm doing. It happens in that mm -hmm. same is it does it you might experience it as somewhat violent so it's useful that that happens in the show it was necessary only the only violence they ever showed was absolutely necessary yeah yeah the the yard not giving fuck is uh there's the willingness to undertake that process as many times as necessary um in his grand a scope or as in minuscule a scope it is however it wants to live itself out now the one amazing thing about this episode is that even when marty didn't think he had it in him to move forward to take the next step he always had the tools on his person to take the next step in this case, the Ozark pamphlet in the secret words, the magic mm -hmm. words, cash rich. The way he deals with Dell is by using, he uses what Dell finds important and then Marty finds it important as well. And it's genuine. He knows he has to align with what Dell finds important or he's not going to, he's not going to make the sale. So there's a lot to be learned about negotiation and about sales, about reframing. Well, that's, it's an exceptional episode. It blows my mind. I've watched it probably eight or nine times by now. <laughs> we showed it at the workshop in England and I hope uh, everyone picked it up. And, and uh, my one fear after watching that first episode was that that thread would get lost or that it would devolve. Uh, mm -hmm or that I was just seeing something that wasn't really there, but it continues and it goes deeper. So join us next week for the Ozark Talks episode two. See you then. See you then. Trail.